Dear Ambassador Amazon, dear Bernard Mattis, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor to speak to you today on the occasion of this annual AmCham Germany meeting. Um, this week, digital innovation seems to be not just a hot topic here in Leipzig, but as we just heard, it was a really hot topic, a little bit up further northwest, I guess it is, in Hannover. It seems like Hannover Messe this year also had one theme that was particularly front and center, and that was digital innovation. That certainly seems to be, have to been true, the front and center piece for these two visitors over here. Because who would have thought that both uh, President Obama and Chancellor Merkel would take these VR glasses and literally show how front and center digital is for them this year. Now, I show this picture not so much because of the VR glasses, but to make the connection between industrial and digital and say that uh, all businesses today have to become digital. It's not just a matter of Google and Microsoft and Amazon and Facebook being digital companies. I think we all understand that really all businesses have to go digital. And that was certainly quite visible in Hanover um, just earlier this week. So, you know, at Google, we have this search engine that's also called Google, and we like to look at it quite a lot to see what's going on and how people are looking at topics. We have a product called Google Trends that if, I, if you don't happen to know Google Trends, you should, because it has a lot of interesting insights, uh, and you can look up basically any trend for any search term. So digital transformation, what are the search term trends for digital transformation across the globe? Well, here are all the search queries, the number of queries over the last 10 years on the topic of digital transformation. So if you were a math major, you would probably say this looks quite exponential. If there ever was an exponential curve, this is one of them. And I firmly believe that we are just at the beginning of this exponential curve, that we're not at the end of it. But digital transformation, not just the interest in it, but the process of digital transformation really is just at the beginning. And there's very good reasons to believe that. For example, as of today, as of 2016, about three and a half billion people around the world have access to the internet, which means that more than half of the people around the world don't have regular access to the internet. But there's lots of studies that show that over the next five plus years, most of them will start having access to the internet. So by 2021, maybe a little bit later, more than seven billion people are expected to be online regularly. By the way, most of those additional people will be going on with mobile devices, not necessarily desktop devices as we know them. So lots of growth just from the sheer volume of people who will be connected to the Internet. And these mobile devices, of course, have an additional effect. They mean that we are always on, we're always connected. I like to think back to the times that I saw Boris Becker on German TV ask the question, bin ich schon drin? So am I online already? You probably remember that, I guess. My kids don't remember that, and they don't relate to that, because they're always online. They can always pull out their smartphone and say, I can look up anything I want, I can you know, be on my social network with my friends. So this notion of literally always being online, I think changes everything from a consumer and from a behavior perspective. So we're online whether we're at home, maybe with multiple devices in front of a TV, whether we're at work, and increasingly, when we're on the go. So we use these short minutes, maybe at the bus stop in public transportation, or even in the car to go online and check what the digital world looks like. But it's not just us as people in our devices, our mobile phones, that, that will help us to go online. In fact, things of everyday life will be connected to the internet, increasingly so. And this could be your washing machine, this could be the lock on your front door, it could be your smoke detector, if you have a dog, it might be the color, uh, the, the color of, of your dog that might be online, and you might have an app that tells you where your dog is at what point in time. By the year 2020, we estimate that more than 50 billion devices will be connected to the Internet. And of course, most of them are not computers in the traditional sense that you have a keyboard and a screen with, but most of them will be these types of Internet of Things devices. So lots of growth that is yet to come. And what does that mean for businesses? How, if you didn't start as a digital business, do you go digital? Well, it seems like that process can be quite hard. Don't know about your organization, but we certainly find in companies that we talk to that there's lots of people who have the power to say no. There is the VP of no, there is the VP of stay the course, and there is the, you know, the VP of let's continue doing exactly what we have done before. 
Even in German companies, I'm told, sometimes that is the case. Certainly sometimes is the case in my company as well. So it's really quite easy to shoot a new idea down, and we all know that and experience that. So what can you do about that? Well, how about you just act like a startup? Maybe you pretend to be a startup and do all the fun things that startups do. Hire a chef, perhaps, or invent new titles, or, as many companies like to do, uh, do the pilgrimage to Silicon Valley for a week or two and see what's going on there. Now, I'm not here to say that these things are bad things. I think these are actually fun things. They are good cultural things to be starting to do. But these types of things to say, I'm just going to pretend that I'm also a startup, may not be enough to get you through digital transformation. So I would argue that what you really have to do is you have to be maniacally focused on your culture and on your people. You may have heard this little uh, uh, line before that is attributed to uh, Peter Drucker that culture eats strategy for breakfast. And I think that was never as true as it is today. In fact, in the digital world, it's digital culture eats strategy for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And why is that so important? Because the future is so uncertain, and you don't exactly know which types of innovations will work. So you need a culture that empowers your entire organization to go digital, and you need less of the VP of no and more of the VP of go. So I just wanted to share with you a couple of ways in which we at Google try to have our culture stay innovative and have our people be part of that process. And it all starts with one mantra that we have at Google, and that's called focus on the user and all else will follow. And I know that sounds incredibly simple, and you can say, well, every marketing textbook says that, and how hard can that be, and we're all customer-focused. Well, I, th I think that's true. It's an old mantra, but it's particularly important in digital. And when we build products at Google, we make them about the user first, not about us, not about our partners, other websites, not even about making money. It all starts with the question, can we solve a problem for our users? Can we provide a use case for them that they will love and that they will use frequently? Because we're convinced that if we do that well, if we address a product need really well, ultimately monetization will follow. So actually we disconnect the two processes of great idea, great customer focus, and then later on think about the business model. In fact, there's many instances in which we take decisions in our products that you could argue are short-term negative to our monetization. So, for example, it would be very easy for us to show lots of additional ads on our search results pages, have them be flashy, have them be pop-ups and unders. All of these things have been tried by many companies over the last years, and they're just annoying to us as users. So we would rather not show an ad to a user than show an ad that's irrelevant. If you're looking for a trip to Mallorca, we will not show you uh, diet pills. We certainly won't. We will show you trips to Mallorca. That's kind of the mantra where we say everything we do to users needs to be relevant, even if it means we have to take a much longer way to sort of begin earning money. And it doesn't just stop there. In terms of what we mean by focusing on the user, I thought I'd give you a little screenshot of something that our engineers put up, our search engineers put up in a team meeting where they said, really the user's problems, all of them are our problems. If a user can't spell, it's our problem. That's why we developed something in search yet, that if you type something in and you don't type it the right way, we want to make it our job to interpret that and to know what you mean. If you don't know how to really form your query, let's say you're looking for two tickets, theater, Berlin, to night 20, uh, 20 o'clock, and you don't quite know how to say that, well, we have to be smart enough to understand what you mean by that, and we have to be able to interpret that. It's our job as a company. If there's not enough content on the web, it's really our job to fix that. That's, our, that's why we started going out and started building Google Maps, because we felt there wasn't really a great map product around the world. That's why we started doing book scans to provide the content of books online, because we felt, well, that's really a shame if you have all of these out-of-stock books that sit in libraries and nobody can read them. So really taking the mindset of whatever the user's problem is, it's really ours, and we have to fix, we have to fix those ideas, the, fix those issues. The second mantra we have is that ideas at Google really can come from everywhere. So it's an element in our culture that's quite important. Many of our best innovations have come bottom up, from a Googler having a great idea and running with it. And we encourage literally everybody to be part of this innovation process, whether you're a product manager, an engineer, 
or whether you work in sales and marketing, you should contribute your ideas to, to, uh, to Google and to innovation. For that, we for a long time have something that's called 20% time. So we provide people with the opportunity to take 20% of their work time and spend it on an idea that's not technically part of their job or of any roadmap. And uh, this has worked really well for us because some of our coolest products and features have come out of 20% time where somebody has just said, I have a passion for this, I want to drive this, uh, and I want to try something out. I'll give you an example like Gmail. There were lots of email clients around 10 years ago before Gmail existed. One of our engineers said it really is terrible that I can only store 10, 15 megabytes at that time. 10, 15 megabytes of free storage in my email, right? Why not have a, a, a G, an, an email service where that constraint goes away? So that idea was not coming top down from, from a smart manager who said, let's build a new email service. It came bottom up. So I think you have to have a culture that enables this kind of thought process where people come up with great ideas and feel it's their job to do so. It's not somebody else's job. Now, of course, not every idea may be brilliant, and you also need to have a way to interpret which ones to pursue. So for that, we have this concept that our CEO, Larry Page, likes to stress, which is, is this idea 10x better than things that already exist? Or is it only 10% better? If it's 10% better, it might be good, but we might not be that interested in pursuing it. We might, be wa we might want to stretch ourselves and really come up with a much, much bigger um, sort of idea and solution. So there's a fairly simple framework that our, our colleagues at Google X, our sort of think tank, like to use, and they say they look for huge unaddressed problems. Going back, for example, to the internet access point, three and a half billion have access, almost four billion people don't have access. How do you solve that? It's going to take years for us to put you know, enough fiber in the ground to get to all the people in remote parts of the world. It's not going to be scalable. Well, how about if you had a technical solution to that, which means you put balloons up in the air in the stratosphere 30,000 meters high, and they stream internet access down to, to the world. It sounds completely outrageous, and maybe it will never work, but we're working on it. And we have it in test mode, and our engineers came up with this idea because they reframed the issue. Rather than saying, let's go a little bit faster on, you know, having broadband through, through regular mobile um, networks or building a little bit faster uh, fiber into the ground, they basically reframed the problem and said, let's come up with a really radical solution over here. Next concept that we hold dear is fast is much better than slow. So I hope you experience that when you use our products. Uh, hopefully our search uh, uh, works, our search engine works really fast for you, that already when you type, we give you search results that basically, even before you've ended your query, give you the most relevant results. This is also the whole background behind our browser Chrome, that Chrome was started with the idea to say, browsers are really clunky and slow, let's build one that takes all the rest out and just make it really, really fast and safe, and then people will be happy. But it's also a mindset when developing products. What I mean by that is we try to build products and put them out into the market really fast, oftentimes in beta versions, where the product may not be quite as perfect, but we will get a lot of learnings from our users and they will tell us what's good and bad about it. And when they can get to use and play around with the product, we can iterate it on, on it very, very quickly. So for us, product development most of the time is not this big bang, where we go out and have this one finished ideal product. And I know that for us in Germany, sometimes it's a bit scary because we like our engineering to be perfect and put it out there and be brilliant. Well, I think in the digital world, it's not quite like that. That's not the winning concept. You actually have to be able to live with a little bit of imperfection, but then to be very fast in learning from that imperfection. And we do that with a concept that we call sort of launch, iterate and morph, because not every one of our products will end up being this brilliant success. Um, we have many products that we have taken off the market after they haven't really worked, but usually what we've tried to do is we've tried to take the best elements out of them and morph them into something new. So for example, we've taken features from Frugal, which was our very first attempt to structure uh, shopping on the net, and we've taken the very best from a product called Google Product Search, which also doesn't exist anymore, and that now has become Google Shopping. So you sort of see new products having slices of old products in them, and that's kind of how we think about that. Same thing with Google Checkout, which has evolved into uh, Google Wallet and the next iteration becoming Android Pay. So we want to make products that don't quite work. Actually, we want to reward people who have tried products that don't quite work. So we have an award internally that's called the Courageous 
Penguin Award. When you have these large groups of penguins and they have to jump off a cliff, one penguin has to jump first, and that's the courageous penguin. And you want to reward that penguin for taking the risk, for putting something out there, for not quite knowing if it works, obviously for being smart about the learning, but you want to actually have a culture where it's cool and okay to try, and you learn something if it doesn't quite work out, and then you move on. Last night we heard from our professor at HHL, uh, from actually the dean of HHL, about the half-life of knowledge actually becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. So obviously we try to create a culture at Google that enables constant learning. Um, most of our trainings are delivered by Googlers to other Googlers. People who have a passion in a topic and who know something about a topic just say, hey, I'll offer a class on you know, whether it's web development or whether it's a customer insight topic, and they provide these trainings to others. And there's not really, there's no structure around it that's top down. It all comes bottom up because we think it's important that our people want to become smarter and uh, learn constantly over time. Because literally what we know today will not be what we need to know in three years' time to continue driving innovation. The final element that I want to talk about is transparency. And we have this concept that we call transparency by default. Um, so we have a deep belief that as an organization, we will be that much stronger and more agile and sort of get everybody much more involved if we're incredibly transparent about the projects that we work on, our businesses, our successes, our failures. So the default mode for any information within Google is always, it's got to be by default open, or you better have a really good reason why it's not. But it's not the other way around, right? And in many organizations, you start with the assumption that only these five people should know about this, and then maybe later on you tell other people. But this default actually is, is quite powerful, and these are our two founders, Larry Page, Sergey Brin. They started this in a weekly meeting format that they call our TGIF, thank God it's Friday meeting, already when the company only had a couple of dozen employees. Every week they would get up, talk about the state of the business, talk, talk about products, and take tough questions. And to that day they do that. So literally every week there is a video conference with these two guys, usually in shirts and hoodies, and they come out and talk about the state of the business, and then they take tough questions. And every question is fair game. There's no question that gets pre-vetted by this group of lots of people who decide whether it's okay to ask the CEO a question, they literally will ask, answer the question. We have a way of people being able to vote on questions, right? Otherwise, you get a thousand questions for half an hour. That doesn't work. So there's a voting mechanism where we get to vote which questions are the most interesting, and then these guys will answer them. That's a huge cultural element, because as managers and other parts of the business, we try to, of course, emulate being as open about what's happening and about taking questions. Final point, I'd like, to all of, I'd like to invite all of you for a moment to sit back and relax and enjoy the moment. Because it's literally early times in digitization, and the pace of change will never be as slow again as it is today. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Looking forward to taking your question. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>